Hey everyone, Victor is here and in this video I wanna talk about the reduction of carbonyls like aldehydes and ketones with complex hydrides such as sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. So let's look at the mechanism of this reaction starting with the sodium borohydride. First of all, I want to point out a couple of things here that when it comes to these reagents, the methanol that you're commonly going to be seeing with this reaction, that is just going to be a solvent and the proton source. And sodium borohydride, this piece is over here, naturally that one is going to be our reducing agent. And the first thing that I'm going to do here, I will draw my sodium borohydride. The sodium is just a counter ion, so we don't really care about that. However, my BH4 minus, that is our reducing agent, so we care very much about that. The first step in this reaction is going to be the nucleophilic attack from our borohydride on the carbonyl. So we are going to show that step like so. So, and the important thing to recognize here is that we are essentially going to be making a new bond between the hydrogen and the carbon of our carbonyl. So essentially you can think about your borohydride as the source of the nucleophilic H-. So don't make a bond with between carbon and boron here. That is not the hydroboration reaction that you have learned for the alkenes. Now once we do this nucleophilic attack, we are going to end up making a new bond between the hydrogen and carbon of our carbonyl and we are going to have the negatively charged oxygen so our intermediate here is going to be the alkoxide. Of course we are not going to keep this alkoxide around because we have our methanol and that methanol is going to do the proton transfer so that is going to be our source of protons so we are going to say that the oxygen is going to come in grab that proton from our methoxide and as a result we are going to get the alcohol which is going to be our final product in this case. Pretty straightforward. Now, when it comes to the same reaction but with lithium aluminum hydride, the thing is going to be very similar. So I'm going to look at this example and before we go into the mechanism itself, there are a couple of things that I want to point out. First of all, lithium aluminum hydride is a much stronger base than the nucleophile and a source of the H-, and because of that, we are going to do the this reaction as a two-step process. In the case of the sodium borohydride, it was together with methanol because sodium borohydride reacts very slowly with the methanol, so we can do our reaction. If you try to add lithium aluminum hydride with any source of protons, well, that's going to be explosive reaction, and I mean it literally. So with that in mind, our first step here is going to be the reaction between lithium aluminum hydride, which looks very similar to sodium borohydride, and here we are, like in the previous case, going to do the reaction between our hydride and our carbonyl. So in this case, again, we are going to be making a bond between my hydrogen of my aluminum hydride and this carbon of the carbonyl. So like in the case of the sodium borohydride, lithium aluminum hydride is just the source of essentially H-. So as a result of this nucleophilic attack, we are going to make a new carbon-hydrogen bond. We are going to make the negatively charged intermediate alcohol oxide like in the previous case, so now we can move on to our acidic workup and in this case, similar to what we had before, we are going to take oxygen, grab the proton now from our acid and as a result of this acidic workup, we are going to get our final product which is again going to be just an alcohol. So if the mechanism is the same and the products are the same, does that mean that lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride are interchangeable? Well, for the purposes of the aldehydes and ketones, they are. They do have different reactivity towards the carboxylic acids and their derivatives, but that's a topic for a different video. For now, let's move on to some examples. For my first example here, I have the reaction between the cyclopentane carbaldehyde and sodium borohydride in methanol, which is our solvent. So the first thing that I'm going to do here, I will draw my sodium borohydride and I will show the nucleophilic attack 
from the borohydride onto my carbonyl, making a new bond, like always, between my hydrogen and the carbon of the carbonyl. As a result of this attack, we are going to get the following alkoxide intermediate, which, of course, is going to grab the proton from our solvent, methanol in this case, so I'm going to show that the oxygen is going to reach out, grab that proton from our methanol, and give us the final product looking like this. So in this case, when we are reducing the aldehyde, we are going to end up with the primary alcohol as the final product. Pretty easy, right? Now, let's take a look at something a little bit more complex. Here, I have this ketone reacting with the lithium aluminum hydride, and then we're going to do our acidic workup. So, step number one, I'm going to draw my lithium aluminum hydride, and I'm going to do the nucleophilic attack from the aluminum hydride onto the carbonyl, as always, making a bond between the hydrogen and the carbon of the carbonyl, which going to result in the formation of the following intermediate. Then, from this point, I'm going to bring my acid for the acidic workup, and here, just like we would expect, we are going to grab the proton from our acid like so, and that going to give us the final product looking like this, a secondary alcohol in this particular case. But here is something that I want to point out specifically for these types of examples. The thing is, as soon as you add the hydrogen to your carbonyl, that carbon of what used to be a carbonyl can potentially become a stereocenter. So, like in this case, if I redraw my molecule over here, I actually do have a chiral atom. And in this case, I have the OH group, I have my methyl group, I have the rest of the molecule, and we also have this hydrogen. So, we have four different groups connected to that uh, central atom, which makes it chiral. Which means that we are going to be looking at the formation of two different stereoisomers. And while some instructors might not really care about that, some will be testing you on that. So, be very careful here. Which means that for exam purposes, sometimes you might be asked to provide the major product, and if there are multiple stereoisomers, you will be asked to uh, state the relationship between those stereoisomers. So, in this case, we are going to get these two molecules in one, the OH is looking at us, and another one, which is looking away from us. And in this particular case, that is a pair of enantiomers. But do not blindly say pair of enantiomers for any secondary alcohol that you are going to make out there. Let's look at this example over here. I have my cyclic ketone reacting with sodium borohydride. So, first I'm going to bring in my sodium borohydride over here, and I'm going to do my nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl like so, which going to result in the formation of the following uh, intermediate, where I have made a new bond between the hydrogen and the uh, carbonyl, so now I have my O-. Following with the mechanism of this reaction, my next step here is going to be the protonation, so I'm going to show that my oxygen here is going to grab my proton like so, giving me the uh, final product looking like this. Now, in this case, if I analyze my stereochemistry, I'm going to, first of all, redraw my product, and very carefully looking at that, I will see that I actually have two chiral atoms. But here is something important about this particular molecule. Now, if I draw two of my possible products, the top stereocenter, that methyl group that used to be looking at us, that thing has never changed. We did not touch the stereochemistry of that carbon in any way or form throughout the reaction, which means that we are going to keep on writing it as we had it from the very beginning. However, the bottom stereocenter, while well, that stereocenter has two different stereo configurations, which means that in this case, we have a pair of diastereomers. So, whenever you are dealing with the stereochemistry and the stereochemical outcomes of any of your reactions, make sure that you analyze the actual pair of products, and don't just blindly say that they are enantiomers or diastereomers, 
or whatever might be the case. All right, I have a couple more awesome examples here for you. So in my next example, I even say that there is going to be some tricky stuff here because let's work through the mechanism and see what happens here. First of all, as always, I'm going to bring my sodium borohydride and that sodium borohydride is going to do the nucleophilic attack on my carbonyl like so, which in this case is going to make a new carbon hydrogen bond, so we are going to end up with the following uh, negatively charged oxygen. But here is the thing, this negatively charged oxygen is inherently a nucleophile, and at the same time, in this molecule, you have an electrophilic carbon with the living group sitting right there. And since intramolecular reactions typically happen way faster than anything else, we are going to have a nucleophilic attack from this oxygen onto our carbon, kicking our living group out. So we are going to make a new uh, bond between the oxygen over here and this carbon, which means that we are going to end up with a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 membered ring, which is going to look like this. So here, if I renumber my atoms, I have my oxygen, which was atom number one, then atom number two, three, four, and five, and carbon number five, if we look at our previous structure, that is the one that is, uh, well, that used to be our electrophile and used to have our living group. So we made a new bond, new bond right over here. I'm going to show it as a new bond between oxygen, which was our atom number one, and carbon, which was our atom number five. And as per usual here, I'm going to redraw my product so I can analyze the stereochemical outcome I see that I have one chiral atom, which does mean that I am going to see a pair of enantiomers in my final reaction mixture. And while I don't expect you to see trickery like that on every single test or every single quiz or homework, that is definitely a fair game and I have seen it many times. So remember that intramolecular reactions are incredibly fast and they can efficiently make five or six membered rings and if it is a possibility to make a five or a six membered ring, definitely go for it. So keep an eye on reactions like that so you don't get caught on that on the exam. And before we wrap up for today, there is one more example that I want to show you and I call them catch them all just like your Pokemons. So in this case, in this molecule, I have two functional groups. I have a ketone and I have an aldehyde. Whenever we are doing reduction with a complex hydride like lithium aluminum hydride, or sodium borohydride, there is not enough reactivity difference between aldehydes and ketones to distinguish effectively between them. So whenever you're doing this reaction, all of your aldehydes and all of your ketones in your molecule will be reduced, which means that in this case, both of my functional groups will be reduced to the corresponding alcohols as well. So here I'm going to end up making the corresponding dialkoxide and then when I do my acidic workup, I will end up with the corresponding diol or dialcohol if you like. And in this particular case, I do have one chiral atom, which means that here I am going to end up with a pair of enantiomers. However, in cases like that, be always extremely careful because multiple carbonyls can potentially give you multiple chiral atoms. So you might as well end up not just with a pair of enantiomers or diastereomers, but you can end up with four molecules or maybe eight molecules as your products. So analyze what you have there, and in cases like that, typically I see instructors say that you can ignore the stereochemistry unless they want you to draw, you know, all possible products. Now, what if I have a situation like this, where I have a ketone and another carbonyl, which is an ester? How would this reaction work then? Well, that would be the topic of my next video, so make sure you boop the like button and subscribe so you don't miss that, and I'll see you next time!